Hello, everyone. Welcome to Remote, the Connected Faculty Summit, hosted by ASU. My name's Athena Kennedy, and I'm the Online Program Launch Director at Purdue Online, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, there are a few things to note. On the left side of your screen, you'll see a panel with a few key tabs. Chat allows you to interact with your fellow attendees. Questions enables you to submit your questions for the speaker to answer at the end of their presentation. Slides and or other related resources can be found in the handouts tab. If needed, resize and rearrange the panels on your screen just like you would a browser window. Click the icons on the bottom of your screen to open or close additional panels such as speaker bios, abstract, share, and, share, and often and handouts. You should have, should you have any technical issues, please refresh your browser. If your issue is not resolved, please submit a note to the questions tab for assistance. Today's pre presentation is being recorded and will be available to watch on demand after the event. Now on to the presentation. The Blend Flex model, how does that work? Discussing today's topic is Tom Canova of University of Central Florida. He's the Vice Provost for Digital Teaching and Learning. Let's turn it over to Tom to get started. Thank you, uh, Athena, and thank you everybody for tuning in. So um, I am Tom Cavanaugh. I am Vice Provost for Digital Learning at the University of Central Florida, and we're gonna be talking about something called the BlendFlex model. Um, how does that work? Uh, you're probably wondering. Well, it to be, to be completely honest, we're wondering a little bit too. This is all very new for us. So let's start just with a, a very small amount of context so you understand um, the environment that I'll be talking about at UCF. We're a large R1 public university located in Orlando, Florida. We have uh, just over 69,000 students as of last fall, 69,500. Um, we have over 13,000 faculty and staff, 220 plus degree programs, and we are a, a Hispanic serving institution with, with over 26% Hispanic and 47% um, minority. So let's talk a little bit about the fall. Now, obviously, this is a, a highly fluid, dynamic uh, environment, as, uh, as I'm sure all of you are dealing with. But a few things that, that we've sort of jotted down is what we expect for the fall context. The first is that we know we're going to have to maintain uh, maximum flexibility for instructional delivery. We will need to ensure physical distancing guidelines within the classrooms, six feet of space between every student and between the students and the faculty, what we are calling, each room now has what we're calling a COVID capacity, which represents about 25 or 30% of the total room capacity, which allows for all of that distancing to, to take place. We know with COVID capacity, we don't have enough physical rooms that we can move all of these courses to larger spaces so that we can still have the same number of students being served in those spaces. We also know we don't wanna reduce the enrollment to what the new reduced COVID capacity is. I mean, not only is that terrible for educational access, if only 25% of the, the original students can attend, but it's also frankly not great for tuition and, and revenue. We also know we don't wanna create some sort of instructional class system where for those students who do want some face-to-face -face experience where it's being offered, um, that some, you have some haves and some have nots, where some can have that and others just can't. And um, what we'd like to do is for those courses where it makes sense to have some face-to-face -face experience, that, um, that we'd be a little more equitable about, about how students have access to it. We also know that in, or we expect that in any given class, at any given point in the term, any number of students or even the faculty may need to be remote for short or long durations, whether they need to quarantine or self-isolate or they've been exposed to somebody who potentially is, um, is sick. Um, we know we could potentially have students cycling in and out of the classroom throughout the term. And uh, how do we continue to support those students and their academic progress? So kind of a philosophy we've been operating under is the more complex the context, the simpler the solution needs to be. Do we have some sort of Swiss army knife solution for this really rapidly changing complex set of circumstances? 
So here's what we've come up with, this idea of this blend flex model. And you're probably wondering, what, is, what does that mean? We didn't make up the term. We, we've heard about it, and we know that some others have, have, um, have used that term elsewhere. But uh, I don't think, I'm not aware of sort of a universal definition for what blend flex is. So what I'm going to describe is our implementation of it. And we've called it blend flex because it differs slightly from the implementation of high flex, which many of you are probably already familiar with. And, and maybe the best way to kind of set the context is with a, a very short video that will describe, this is a video we produced for students that was just released that will describe how it works from a student perspective. Welcome to a quick guide to the BlendFlex delivery model. This academic year at UCF will require a significant amount of flexibility on the part of both faculty and students. In order to maintain academic quality while accommodating the social distancing needs of students and instructors during the COVID crisis, selected face-to-face -face and mixed-mode courses will be delivered through the BlendFlex delivery model. So, what is BlendFlex? Well, BlendFlex is basically the blending, or combining, of the face-to-face, -face, remote, and online course modalities. UCF's goal is for students that wish to return to campus for face-to-face -face instruction be allowed to do so and those that aren't comfortable returning or able to return to still be able to watch lectures taking place on campus and also participate in class virtually. When you enroll in a BlendFlex course, you can expect to have the option of attending class on campus, in person, part of the time, and attending remotely to live lectures using a video conferencing tool like Zoom, or viewing the recorded lectures the other part of the time. How does BlendFlex work? Your class will be divided and you will be placed into a smaller group of students that meet the physical distancing requirements in the assigned classroom space. For example, if you enroll in a course that meets on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and there are 100 students in the course, the course will be split into three groups of approximately 33 students. You will be assigned a class day and permitted to attend that one in-person class meeting per week. For instance, if you are assigned to Wednesdays, you cannot choose another day to attend in person. Your only option is your Wednesday assigned group day. When not in the physical class on Mondays and Fridays, you will attend remotely either live or through a recorded session. A real-time video session or recording of each class meeting will be available to you when not in the classroom on a given day. Look for instructions and information from your instructor on how they plan to assign students to particular days. Make sure to read your course syllabus and become familiar with your instructor's attendance policies should you choose to not attend on your assigned day. We understand how important it is to be flexible, and at any given point in the term, you may need to be remote for short or long durations. BlendFlex course delivery is UCF's option for providing that flexibility. As always, communication between you and your instructor is vital to your success at UCF. For more information on BlendFlex, you can contact web courses at UCF support, or visit the Division of Digital Learning at dl.ucf.edu forward slash BlendFlex dash student. Okay, so that was a brief overview uh, from a student perspective on, on how this works. Uh, the first week of July, we published our updated revised schedule. I think there probably will likely be a few a few additions and um, adjustments before the fall term begins at the end of August. But right now, some rough numbers are about a third, slightly under a third of the university's sections will include some element of a face-to-face -face component, whether that's just a blended course or it's a face-to-face -face course. Um, that that um, is currently still scheduled in a face-to-face -face, uh, modality. The rest of the university's courses, more than two-thirds, are planned to be remote uh, or online uh, this fall. So for those courses that are, it's been determined are best to be taught in a face-to-face -face environment within that third, right now we have at least a third, maybe more of those that have explicitly said they're going to use this BlendFlex uh, strategy. 
So how does it work? Just again, sort of recap. Um, in any typical instructional week, the class would be split into these smaller cohorts that meet our physical distancing requirements in the assigned space. Uh, the students would only be permitted to attend one of these class meetings per week. And this is how it differs from high flex. In high flex, the students have complete agency to decide when to show up and when not to show up. In blend flex, they're assigned a day. And one of the main reasons um, that, that we've uh, advocated for this is so that we don't put the faculty in the position of policing attendance. If, for example, too many students showed up in a class section on any given day and exceeded our COVID capacity, then it would be the faculty person's job to send students away and ensure that some students, um, or only some students attended and others um, didn't in order to keep the, the proper distance between them. And, and really, I, I don't think that's fair to a faculty member to ask them to enforce the, the room limitations. So the idea is that um, students would be assigned a day and that they could attend only that day. And if they chose not to attend that day or for whatever reason couldn't attend that day because they were self-isolating or quarantining or something, then they could still attend remotely. So say, for example, a class that typically has 100 students enrolled, about 33 would physically meet on Monday, another 33 would physically meet on Wednesday, and say the last 34 would meet on Friday, and then the others would attend remotely. Um, <clears throat> so the balance of the week would be consumed by the student, participated in by the student, either live synchronously through a Zoom or Panopto, or uh, through a recorded session. We do know we have some very large sections, those that, um, that are not been put completely remote, and, uh, and we have others that have a twice a week meeting schedule. There has been some discussion about doing a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, potentially. Um, I don't know if all of those decisions have been made. Um, and um, we know that in certain situations like that, the, the students may need to be split into additional cohorts or limited to maybe a once every other week in-person meeting schedule or some other creative arrangement um, to comply with the physical distancing guidelines. Although what I'm, what I'm hearing so far is that when these exceptions pop up, uh, it's easier just to move those courses to a fully remote environment. And it seems to be what's happening in most cases. So as I've said, students can't necessarily choose which day to attend in person. They can only uh, go on their assigned day. If they choose not to go on their assigned day, that's sort of their prerogative within the faculty attendance requirements. Um, and we've encouraged, our provost has encouraged faculty to not have rigorous attendance requirements this fall. Um, one of the advantages is faculty can, can use the same syllabi and lesson planning because each cohort is part of the same course, this, this subgroup of the overall course. And so the faculty member would just teach as they normally would Monday, Wednesday, Friday, as if they were just teaching to the class normally, because because they are. It's just some students are physically in front of them. The, the group of students that are physically in front of them changes from Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, but they're still teaching the same students because some of them are remotely, are remote. Um, it's important too that uh, faculty be, be uh, cognizant of what they're doing in the physical classroom. There's a reason why these courses have been uh, scheduled to be in person and not remote, because we're trying to do as much remote as possible. There are things about that course that make it better in person. And faculty need to be careful not to, to for example, disadvantage certain members of the cohorts by say doing, we're only gonna do role plays on Mondays. Well, then that means that the Wednesday and Friday groups don't get to participate in those classroom role plays. Faculty may need to spread some of that out to be a little more equitable. Um, and uh, we are encouraging, uh, if, if not requiring, faculty to, to try to make a recording of every class session because we recognize that some students will not be able to participate um, synchronously if they are consuming it remotely, especially if they're ill and are trying to make up work or something like that. Uh, and different models are, are available. Um, so some faculty have asked us like, well, do I have to do this or could I uh, flip the class and put my lectures online and then have a discussion on Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the classroom? And the answer is, of course, what a great idea. Within this model, you can do whatever makes sense. The idea is to um, make sure that everybody is safe. So a few considerations. Um, um, 
some of these I talked about already, um, but just to kind of underscore the difference between this and high flex is that the students cannot choose which day they attend in person. Their only option is that assigned cohort day. A little bit about the technology. Um, we do have a very consistent configuration across the campus for our, our technology in our rooms. And that, that has made planning for this a lot easier. I will give our former CIO who just retired, Joel Hartman and my colleague Don Merritt here, a lot of credit for the foresight to standardize in our classrooms. So they're all basically configured smart classrooms. Uh, there are some slight variations that exist. So the design, integration, programming, or support are, are all done in-house by our Office of Instructional Resources. We've designed all of our rooms to have consistent functionality across all of the spaces, regardless of who owns the space, whether some of it's owned by the colleges, uh, they schedule their own in their own buildings, some of it's owned by the registrar's office or the general scheduled classrooms. But no matter when or where a class is taught, the instructor kind of only has to prep once. All of our specialty rooms, things like labs and lecture capture, um, are built on top of this consistent platform so that those rooms can be used as traditional classrooms when they aren't being used by that specialty um, location. So every room will have a, a Crestron control system. We have an in-room computer. We do have projectors and, and or large monitors. Uh, we do have a document camera. We do have um, uh, a microphone that's uh, on the podium. So it, we do have lapels and other things um, in certain places, but the standard for this will be a microphone on the on the podium. Faculty doesn't have to worry about it. They just kind of stand there and talk. Some of the add-ons, we had about 320 rooms that we had to uh, slightly um, improve the the hardware and uh, tech that was in the room uh, because what was in there didn't quite meet the standard for what we wanted to accomplish. So we're adding a uh, USB webcam, uh, microphone, capture card, audio cable, and uh, programming. Uh, we did request some funding from our provost office and uh, they have stepped up. Uh, was not as much as you would think. Um, in fact, it was fairly minimal in my opinion because the rooms were in such good shape to begin with, that platform, that consistent platform is already there. So some advantages to the um, to this blend flex model, as I said earlier, faculty don't have to significantly modify their planned original face-to-face -face pedagogy. There's only minor adjustments to classroom practice. So for example, they cannot use the whiteboard in the classroom, the one that's mounted on the wall. The, the cameras just will not pick it up. It's not, it's not a high enough contrast or quality. So instead, faculty must use the document camera. And um, that will be captured for the remote audience and can be projected in the classroom for the, the physical audience. So it's a similar experience as if the faculty member was writing on the whiteboard. It, it's projected in the same spot where a whiteboard would be. Um, faculty can't wander around the room as much as they might like or be, or be used to doing. They kind of have to say within about a five to six foot area um, behind the podium where the camera and the microphone can still pick them up. We've tested it with faculty wearing masks, which they will have to do, and um, there hasn't been any problem uh, understanding or hearing them. Um, as I said, most classrooms are already equipped with the basic technology. There's a few exceptions where we have to just sort of improve it. Um, we do expect faculty will want to bring their own equipment on occasion, uh, such as laptops, and that should be no problem. You should just be able to plug right into the, into the podium there in the classroom as they normally would. Um, if for whatever reason faculty or students cannot be on campus or we have to bug out again like we did this spring, like all of you did this spring, and go remote, it should be a much easier transition to do it in this sort of a class that's already got the infrastructure built in to go remote than it, than it was in the spring for classes that did not expect it. And what we have found in our previous um, implementations of high flex strategies, we've had some lecture capture courses that use high flex kinds of strategies where students could either come in person or they could uh, watch lectures and then they come in to do testing or advising and other kinds of things. Um, what we have found we'll see if history holds, is that students over the course of the term, fewer and fewer of them showed up in every class session as they learned that they could, they could participate remotely. 
um, that became more of the default preference of students as opposed to coming into class. There was always a core, five to 10% who always showed up in class. But over time, more and more of them start to, started to participate online. And if that happened in this environment, in a blend flex environment, it may not necessarily be the worst thing that ever happened. Um, as long as the students are getting the material they need, they're participating as they need, that they understand. Um, but we're also, we're limiting the number of physical bodies in the room, which will help us maintain that, that distancing that we are trying to, uh, that we are trying to accomplish. And then lastly, one other kind of advantage is that active learning might actually be easier online. And we're, we're kind of advocating that. So we have a lot of active learning classrooms. It's a big push here on campus. Um, but doing that in a context where you have to have six feet between every person, uh, I'm frankly not sure how that would even work with students yelling at each other across the tables and trying to collaborate. It might be easier to do active learning online even with your students in the classroom. And then you can involve students who are, who are remote, collaborating with students who are physically there um, in active learning scenarios. Uh, and we think that actually offers some pedagogical advantage. So there are limitations. Uh, you probably thought of several of them already. The first one is that uh, lab sections or similar kinds of courses like performance or um, <laughs> painting, art, ceramics, those kinds of courses that require you to do something physical in the classroom, something psychomotor, tactile, uh, it's, it's going to be really hard to do this kind of a strategy. And um, if, that's, if that's what's required, uh, we are working with those kinds of departments um, on remote labs if that's, if that's their goal and intention. Um, Due to the, the space constraints, as I said earlier, some large courses might limit the student experiences so much that they can only meet once or twice per term. And those, uh, I think actually the decision has already been made since I submitted these slides that those courses are just going to go online. They're just going to be remote. Um, faculty are expected to teach in a face-to-face -face modality in this model. BlendFlex is a face-to-face supported modality. Um, so if faculty plan to be remote during the high risk or because they're high risk or other factors, they, they should just convert the section to be fully remote. And my understanding is we're supporting that. Um, hearing impaired students or other kinds of accessible accessibility needs that students might have will need to be addressed as part of some sort of a captioning plan or other sort of accommodation plan for those students. And that needs to be thought about ahead of time. And as I mentioned, we are investing some additional costs for equipment and support. Um, we're a little concerned about the support needs and do we have the personnel associated to support kind of a, uh, an almost a hybrid model for every course on campus or uh, a good portion of them. That's a, it's an open question. Um, but as I said, the costs weren't as much as I was afraid they might, they might be. So a few additional considerations. Um, we, we have developed professional development. Um, it is in draft form right now. We hope by the end of this week, it will be wrapped up. It'll be a module that faculty can go through, print themselves a certificate to kind of understand the pedagogy, the expectations. Faculty are the ones communicating to students what the meeting pattern will be. They're doing that in, uh, in consultation with their departments and colleges. We are consulting with them on when to use each of our our conferencing platforms, whether it's Zoom or it's Panopto. And it's sort of boiling down to, do you, do you want to have discussions or not? How big is your course? So if you want to have course discussions, Zoom is a, is a better choice. Um, if you want to um, have larger classes, which we have some that are large, um, Panopto is, is typically a better choice. And helping faculty do that sort of decision tree is part of this, is this training that we're developing. Um, how to set it up and record in the classroom on the computer. We've actually programmed the Crestron systems. There's basically going to be a button that says Zoom and a button that says Panopto that allows the faculty to kind of make that choice and, and connect through the in-room computer. As I mentioned, the, the whiteboard versus the, um, versus the document camera, that's important. Um, you could potentially use the Zoom whiteboard or some other electronic whiteboard, but uh, what we have found through just anecdotally talking to faculty is that they prefer to, uh, to just use the document camera. It's easier to just write. 
And then those, those documents can be scanned and put up into the LMS as a, as a study aid for students very easily. Some faculty have done that. We are recommending that assignments and exams should all be put online uh, because of the, the fact that at any given point, you're going to have two thirds of your students online remote. And there is still the possibility that we're going to have to go remote at some point. Um, and we also know that uh, after Thanksgiving, we're not coming back to campus. It's a fully remote online uh, uh, university after Thanksgiving. So you might as well just plan for those assessments and assignments to be uh, online from the start. And we're also suggesting asynchronous online discussions whenever possible. Uh, through the learning management system, rather than kind of synchronous discussions that involve in-person and remote students, it would disadvantage the students who can't uh, participate uh, live remotely. And we also we also know that just from classroom management perspective, it's it takes a lot of effort and energy and intentionality to include the remote students in an on-campus discussion, um, in an in-class discussion. It can be very difficult. Um, camp. It, it's not to say it can't be done, but um, we're recommending that if it if it's if you don't have a pedagogical preference, put those asynchronously. And um, that is our plan. <laughs> Wish us luck come August 24th when we start to implement it. Uh, I think we've got a you know we're we have a lot of experience. We've got 20 plus years of doing online learning and blended learning, and the classrooms are all well configured. I think we've got the infrastructure and the experience, but this is something that we haven't done in this way before. So we'll be, um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be trying to keep track of how it goes, maybe doing some publishing and sharing at conferences later to, uh, to let everybody know, know how it goes. So I think I have, I don't know, maybe four or five minutes for questions, Athena, if, um, if anybody has any. Great, thanks, Tom. That, that was some valuable information. We have about three minutes left, so I'm gonna pick one of the questions that seemed to um, pique interest. And so how can faculty protect their time management with this model? Seems like it might require um, them a little bit more work to accommodate these additional groups. Any thoughts on that, Tom? Yeah, our hope, one of the reasons we picked this model was to minimize impact on faculty. And so one of the ideas is that in a typical lecture course, you would come in and lecture three times a week, and that's all we're asking you to do here. The only difference we're saying is instead of writing on the whiteboard, we're asking you to write on the doc under the document camera. And you can't walk around the classroom. You kind of have to stay in front of the camera, in front of the microphone. But otherwise, you don't have to change your syllabus. You don't have to change your assessment strategy. Um, if you wanted to just come in and lecture and give your exams, you, you could. Um, now, I mentioned some strategies in there, like putting some things online, and there's a flipped model and some other things. That's entirely up to faculty. If they want to go the extra mile and modify things, they absolutely can. But we understand that you got four classes. Maybe some of our instructors or lecturers are teaching. They're not research faculty. Uh, they've got these four preps to do. They may not have the time to um, to to make things different. So uh, the idea was to, as much as possible, um, make it simple for them. That's great, and you you answered in that response how to design a course for the blend flex model, and it sounds like um, having some opportunities for them to flip, but not necessarily requiring that could be a viable option. Folks were asking about the link to the video. I believe it's in the handouts. Is that correct, Tom? Um, yeah, uh, and if you go to our website, we've got a, if you just search keep teaching UCF, I'm sorry, keep learning UCF, uh, you can get to that video from that from that page. Uh, there's a link on there somewhere. Uh, Keep Learning is our student-facing page. Great. And then just one quick other question was on how do you think attendance policies should be handled any differently? Yeah. Well, I know our provost has been explicit in telling faculty that um, that uh, we are recommending that they not have rigorous attendance policies because we just don't think students are going to be able to comply, um, especially if they get sick or they get exposed and they have to isolate. Um, I don't believe he's gone as far as to um, mandate thou shalt uh, when it comes to attendance policies, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if that came at some point. I think, you know, 99.9% .9 of our faculty want to do right by the students and they want to help and they're very understanding. So I, I don't expect that to be a huge issue, but ultimately, uh, at least it's been our practice as a research university with with a lot of faculty autonomy, the attendance policy is the purview of the faculty. 
Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Tom. And for those who have attended, we really appreciate your attendance here at the Remote Summit. We are out of time, unfortunately. Um, however, I encourage you to attend more sessions and to connect with one, one another offline. So thanks again, Tom, and I hope everyone has a great day.